Good. Uh, my name is Leonard Jones, and I'm pastor of the First Baptist Church in Union Park. However, I was born and raised in Sanford over on West First Street. I was born, Mom tells me, right across these woods a short distance. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother were from Sweden. I presume that qualifies me to participate in this activity today, meaning simply I do have some Swedish roots. We want to welcome each one of you to this historic occasion. I hope that uh, it will bring back some fond memories and maybe during the process you will learn some things about the Swedish people and the history of this area that will be both informative and maybe a reminder to some of you and an opportunity to reminisce about your past and think about some of the things you already know but you haven't thought about in a long time and then some, some of the younger ones to learn some things about your ancestors that will be uh, enlightening, exciting, and beneficial. We would like to introduce to you Betty Smith, who will present the history of New Upsala. Betty Smith. I don't have a Baptist preacher's voice, so I hope you can hear me. If you can't, I think there's more room around here if pe some people would like to come around a little closer. And some chairs right here, five or six chairs still left. If your Swedish ancestors could stand the heat, so can we today, right? because I assure you they weren't used to Florida like we are. The history of Swedish immigrants in America, of course, is generally an account of the settling of the prairie states. By 1900, the American Midwest had become a mosaic of Swedish farms and villages. Can't hear, right? Tell you what we might do. If you can't hear this, we might do it all over again when we get down to the air conditioned building, okay? Even the larger communities of Swedes in New England always contained an element that was bound for the homestead further west. In short, folks, what I'm trying to say is not many Swedes came to Florida, so it was highly unusual for them to do so. But for a few years, it was possible to identify five separate and distinct Swedish settlements in central Florida, and the earliest and largest of these was New Uppsala. Can you hear me now? The people who came, who were they? Most of them were young. They were between 20 to 35 in the beginning, and most of them were men, naturally. A manifest of the SS Scandinavia showed that 26 men and six women left Gothenburg, Sweden on April 23, 1871 for the trip to Granton Docks in Scotland. From Granton, they were taken by train to Glasgow, where they boarded another ship for the Atlantic crossing and they arrived in Florida on May 30th, 1871. Now the ship's manifest did not say why they came, obviously. There was only room for name, age, date, and where they were coming from and where they were going to. It didn't say why they came, of course. But generally the reasons for coming were dissatisfaction with conditions in Sweden and certainly hope for a better future in America. And I also want you to know that not one of these people was what we would call an unskilled, leisurely, a lazy gentleman. They were all skilled tradesmen. They were carpenters, masons, painters, and cabinet makers, or horticulturists, who looked forward to using their skills and knowledge in the new country. The total cost of the passage was $75 per person, including fare, food, lodging in New York, and a commission of $8.58 each to the procuring agent. That wouldn't go too far today, would it? Enlisted and encouraged by the same agent, 20 more Swedes arrived on November 7, 1871. 
They had all come under the contract labor law to work in the experimental groves and allied businesses of Henry Shelton Sanford. These were only the first ones. This was only the beginning. In time, these first immigrants were joined by many more of their countrymen. Some came as they had, solicited by an agent of General Sanford, and others in Sweden, hearing of the Florida colony, began the adventure with their own funds. Still others came to the growing settlement from Kansas, Illinois, Maine, and Minnesota. And together they built a community. And it's the sum of their experiences that make up the history of New Uppsala. I told some of you last year, my husband and I went to Sweden, we discovered it's supposed to be pronounced Uppsala. As a distinctly Swedish community, New Uppsala would survive only a few years, hardly to the end of the second generation. But for those few years, the people were considered enterprising and successful and among the most prosperous people in all Florida. Physically, the community was divided into two sections, an upper settlement built along the, both sides of this road here, Uppsala Road, and a lower settlement which followed the curves of the Lane Road. Most of you know where that is. Running south to north, a swamp was the dividing line, and it's still kind of swampy if you, when you go across the second or third division of Idlewild, you know what I'm talking about. Joining the upper and lower settlements, two wagon trails crossed the swamp from east to west. And the newly incorporated town of Sanford lay two miles to the east, and of course the St. John's River about the same distance to the north. A plaque showing the location and subdivision of New Uppsala indicates that most of the Swedish owners held title to lots measuring five chains by ten chains, or approximately five acres. There, thank you. <laughs> It's nice to have a vote of confidence. Lacking official records, it's not been possible to know exactly how many people at any one time lived in Uppsala, but we do have some pretty good estimates. A biographer of General Sanford tells of a Christmas dinner in 1881 at which 145 Swedes were present, including 60 children who had been born in the colony. And Ivar Pearson, writing in the Swedish Pioneer Historical Quarterly, suggests that the total population in 1891 was 117. Only maybe a little bit more accurate is the figure we have when New Uppsala applied for a post office. The application said that the population to be served by the proposed office was 100. So we are assuming that the population at any given time was somewhere between about 100 and 150. Life in the, in the community here was, as you can imagine, very self-contained, at least for a while. Newcomers from Maine and the Prairie States, as well as those from Sweden, could at their own pace make a reasonable adjustment to their new home. Nobody hurried them to become Americanized. They, they didn't have to uh, make any sudden detachment from any culture they had in their old, old home, either in Sweden or in their old colony. But what they did find was hard work, because the business of the colony was citrus production, and it was a profitable business. By 1891, 23 principal grove owners were shipping 500 to 1,000 boxes of fruit a season, and at that time were receiving $1.60 per box for their work. What citrus today? Mr. Chase, how much is citrus today? Where's Mr. Chase? Okay, it's dollar sixty. I suppose was not bad then in 1891, huh? Okay, it was a very profitable business. Everybody prospered. At least one grove owner had his own packing house with a wine room attached, where he turned out grapefruit and orange wine for local consumption. I'm not supposed to tell you who that was. A railroad line provided the necessary transportation for the harvested crops. In 1887, the standard gauge Sanford and Lake Eustis Railroad opened a 29-mile line from Sanford westward to Tiberias. Less than three years later, the line became the Sanford and Lake Eustis division of the Jacksonville, Tampa, and Key West Railway. Four trains daily provided transportation as well as freight service. 
two eastward to Sanford and connections with the South Florida Railway, and two westward to Tavares. For many of the settlers of Upsala, obviously the train was their only connection with Sanford. An 18 by 30 foot wooden station house handled both freight and passenger service. How many of you remember the station house? 18 by 30, it was built on a block foundation and was comprised of a wooden platform and covered shed surrounded by a gravel platform. And from the station to the general store was a narrow gauge track so goods could be pushed along the track both to and from the store. Harrison and Son General Store, later B.O. Seltzer's, was more than a place of business. It was the hub of community life. Post office facilities occupied a corner of the ground floor, while the third floor provided a good hall for dances and socials for the young Swedes. And a variety of goods here showed what a general store is all about. One could buy satchels and shotguns, hardware and harnesses, shirts and shoes, as well as loot fisk and salt herring imported from Jacksonville. The community post office was established on November 11, 1884, with John Munson serving as postmaster. In the beginning, mail was delivered to the office three times weekly by a contracted carrier. Discontinued in January of 1887, the facility was reestablished June 25, 1890, and three more postmasters would serve until the office was finally abolished. Joseph Harrison, Benjamin O. Seltzer, off B. O. Seltzer General Store, and guess what, ladies? Sophia Lundquist. We even had a female postmaster. From 1890 until 1904, mail was received by train from the Sanford Post Office six times weekly then. One of the first buildings to be erected in the new settlement was the Scandinavian Hall, a one-room building to be used for social gatherings and official meetings. And of course, for the Uppsala Swedes, no meeting was more important than one for the education of their children. So the Scandinavian Hall also served as a school. Now, I have heard all my life, and especially since I started doing this research, how much the Swedes believe in education. Well, I'm here to tell you that the new Upsala Swedes did also. Established as a public school number 51 of Orange County, this was then Orange County, Upsala had the dual purpose of teaching the basics of elementary education and, of course, of Americanizing its students. Josephine Jacobs agreed to be the first teacher because she was worried about the education of her brothers and sisters. Having come to New Upsala from Jefferson County, Iowa, she had already recognized the importance of learning English. And apparently, the community shared her feelings. Because during the early years of Upsala, the teachers here qualified for a special pay rate of $2 per pupil rather than the usual $1 because the average daily attendance was so high. So the Swedes saw that their children went to school. Am I right, those of you who can remember? The school term in 1877 and 78 was only three months long, and the teacher was the one who decided which three months the children went to school. By 1879, there was a five-month term beginning September 1st, and this was followed until 1900 when all of Orange County adopted an eight-month term. Guess what you learned at public school number 51 here? If you were a beginner of what we would call a first grader, you learned reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, and geography. And by the third year, you were being tutored in United States history, grammar, and natural philosophy as well. And every time I see we're worried about giving tests to make sure high school graduates can read and write, I think about this. The Scandinavian Society Church Building was located just south of the hall on the same property, here, I believe. And certainly Swedes didn't think their churches had to be stark for salvation's sake. It had a beautifully carved pulpit and pews, and the wooden structure showed the work of skilled craftsmen who had applied their art to the building and its contents. Upsailer churchgoers were not concerned that ornamentation would detract from spirituality but they were not so skilled in organization. Reverend O.O. O. Eckhart, writing in the minutes of the Southeastern Mission District Lutheran Augustana Synod, 
declared that this Uppsala church had, and I'm quoting, the most peculiar history of any congregation in the district. Again, I'm almost quoting word for word from his minutes. At first, there was no official congregation. Instead, the spiritual needs were met by a variety of speakers. Anybody who wanted to could speak. Uh, some lay leaders in the community, an occasional visiting minister. But two events came along to change this setup. The aggressive missionary efforts of the Florida Presbyterians and the arrival of John Frederick Sundell. The Reverend Sundell came to New Upsala in 1883 from New Sweden, Maine, where he had been a lay leader of a Baptist congregation for 10 years. Although he'd been greatly admired as a leader, he had made a break with the church over a point of doctrine and had come to New Upsala seeking a new beginning. Here he preached in the Swedish church, this one, for six years until the Presbyterians came. When the Presbyterians did come, the people at this church feared a Presbyterian takeover, and they officially declared themselves a Lutheran church, deeded the church property to, and affiliated themselves with the Augustana Synod. Mr. Sundell and other members who preferred the Presbyterian doctrine moved a quarter mile south on Upsala Road to establish the Upsala Presbyterian Church. And even as it was born officially, this church began to die. Now I have to stop and qualify this because I know many of you remember the church building being full of people and you remember people attending this church and that one on the same Sunday. But officially, I mean, as far as the official minutes and records of the church, there were never many members of this church. Membership dwindled, in fact, from the beginning, it did nothing but go down until fewer than a dozen, fewer than 12 communicants were listed on its roll. On October 25th, 1890, at a quarterly meeting of the South Florida Presbytery, an application was presented to organize a congregation at Uppsala. Permission was granted and the Presbyterian Church of Uppsala was officially entered on the rolls of churches. Two ruling elders and one deacon were chosen and ordained, and sometime during the year 1892, the congregation, using their building and carpentry skills, built a second church for the Uppsala community. Both churches had been built by the same hands. The winter of 1894-95 brought a sudden calamity to the settlers of Uppsala. On the night of December 29, 1894, a hard breeze hit the citrus groves of Orange County. And then again in February, when the trees were beginning a new growth, another mass of frigid air sent the temperature even lower to an official record of 18 degrees. And local residents say that because Upsala is in, quote, cold, unquote, area, and believe me, I live down the road, it, this is a cold spot through here, that the temperature was probably even lower here. Well, today it would be declared a disaster area, and we'd have federal funds, I'm sure, for rebuilding and, and, and getting back together. <clears throat> but there was no help in those days. The people of Upsala had no federal help or any other kind of help. And when the freeze came, they were almost entirely dependent on their citrus crops for money income. In three months, it was all gone. So the passing of Uppsala was not a slow process of disintegration, gradual and scarcely noticeable. It was almost an event. It almost happened overnight. After the freeze, there are unconfirmed stories of families leaving everything behind as they set out for new starts in different areas. A Mr. Lindgren and his family left for Miami, and the story I'm told, they huddled with their budwood, freshly cut budwood, to keep it from freezing on the way to Miami. Some others who had knowledge of bulb culture and gardening worked at landscaping in the Miami area, and others moved to some of the other Florida Swedish communities, and there were, were four others, as I've said. As few as 16 families chose to stay here on the land they had worked so hard for. And their incomes, of course, were gone. Their money incomes were gone. So the men had to look for jobs outside the community. Many of them went to work for the Planters Manufacturing Company in Lake Mary, producers of starches, dextrines, farina, and tapioca. 
A letter from the company president to one of the Swedes says, and I quote, while we can't pay you contractor's wages, we can give you $2.50 and a half for 10 hours work. He was further encouraging by saying, nearly all the Uppsala boys are here. So I'm assuming that most of the adults, able-bodied men at one time or another went to work there. One by one, the familiar structures and institutions of Uppsala disappeared. The train station with its sign, New Uppsala, was torn down in 1927 after several years of inactivity. Sometimes the train stopped to let off a passenger, but that was about all that even marked the existence of this community as far as the, the train was concerned. And in fact, the station was demolished in um, 19, I can't remember, can't remember. It was demolished at a cost of $75 paid to a contractor, B.B. Dale. Cost $75 to tear it down. The O. Seltzer store building, once the center of social life and commercial activity, was moved to private property and used for storage. Of course, it was no longer needed to house the post office because that ceased to exist, too, in 1904. Where the Scandinavian Society had held meetings and where dozens of young Swedes had had their early education, now nothing marked the site because the school building, too, was removed. As early as 1926, minutes of the Southeastern Mission District of the Augustana Senate of the Lutheran Church said there are only five members left, and they're all old people, two of them past 80. I stand corrected. I'm quoting, ma'am. <laughs> For years, it had been difficult even supplying a pastor to this congregation. Obviously, it couldn't support itself. Finally, on August 16, 1946, by official court order, the congregation of Uppsala Lutheran Church was dissolved and all its property deeded to the Board of Home Missions. The building, too, disappeared. The Presbyterian Church of Uppsala somehow survived, kept alive for years, as I know all of you know, by a handful of people, of lay leaders. Since 1892, it has stood on the corner down here, overlooking the community it still serves. And I see some of your good Presbyterian friends here today. Today, with an active membership of 75, the church, of course, remains an important institution in this community. Well, if you want to look for other signs of Uppsala, you have to know where to look, as all of you know. Try telling somebody on the outside how to find this cemetery. Try, tell, try telling them how to find the other cemetery out at the corner of 46A and Banana Lake Road. Obviously, we're here to dedicate the sign at this cemetery. Today, as you can see, besides this marker here, we have only the giant oaks overlooking the grave. Some unmarked, we believe, of all your ancestors. The bronze tablet over here reads, Uppsala Church, Augustana Lutheran Synod, 1892 to 1946, marker placed by St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, Orlando, Florida, May 18, 1951. To the west, on a corner of State Road 46A and Banana Lake Road, the Presbyterian Cemetery can hardly be seen. How many of you have been out there lately? Well, you will hardly find it. It's been damaged by vandals down through the years. Saplings are growing over the graves. And you, you really have to know it's there to even find it. And the county. And the county. The, I got a call not long ago. Somebody's, the road department wants to know about that cemetery. Uh, the, then the, we'll blame the county for at least part of it, for sure. And then, of course, in the city of Sanford, on the grounds of the Henry Shelton Sanford Memorial Library, a marker reads, and I know you've all read it a dozen times, but I want to read it again. In this vicinity, Henry Shelton Sanford, pioneer citrus grower, established the St. Gertrude Grove in 1871. There and at his Bel Air Grove and Experimental Gardens, he advanced the industry through development of some 140 types of citrus. The Sanford Gardens experimented with other tropical fruits, planting 30,000 exotic trees from South America and Africa. Much of the labor in the groves was performed by Swedish immigrants who settled at nearby New Uppsala. 
And then, of course, there are the birthday girls, and I can't forget them. It, those of you who don't know, who also, who's a member of the birthday girls? Olga and Mrs. Lee and Eunice Martin, and who else? Alice. Okay, you share your Swedish memories, and I told the people down at West Palm Beach that I expected to be invited to the next birthday, okay? It is, I have to tell you something personally. That's all of my history. It's been more pleasure than I could possibly ever tell you working on this. I've met some of the most wonderful people in the world doing it. I would like to give a special thanks today to somebody who helped put this program together. And without her, you wouldn't be here today because I didn't have time to do it all. Lenore Jones, please give her a hand. It's also my pleasure at this time to introduce the chairman of the Seminole County Historical Commission, Beverly Mason. Thank you, Betty. It certainly was a lot of good historical information, and it makes me very proud as chairman of the Seminole County Historical Commission to recognize the historical significance of this plot where family and friends of many of you are remembered right here. So at this time, we dedicate the marker that's placed on the road in love and memory of all who were a part of this early Seminole County Upsala settlement. And I want to thank each one of you for coming to this service today and being a part of it and really making it significant. And thank you, Betty, for your program. And I uh, would like to recognize two of our other commission members that are here, Lorraine Whiting and Bonner Carter. There we go. Thank you for coming, all of you. Betty? Now we would like to recognize Father Arthur Kreinader, Hader, ordained in Sweden of the Lutheran Church and a member of the Brotherhood of the Holy Cross. We're happy to have you today, and I believe you're responsible for the handouts, aren't you? Mrs. Smith asked me if I would come and take part in this celebration. I'm now serving on the staff at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Orlando who placed this marker here at the cemetery. This cemetery is under the supervision of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Orlando. I started Swedish services at St. Paul's Lutheran Church last September, but so few, so few Swedish people came that they are temporarily suspended. But I'm hoping that maybe we can find enough Swedish people in Orlando that we can again have Swedish services on Sunday evenings. Mrs. Smith asked me to take part in this service, and I thought the best thing to do was to have us all sing the one Swedish hymn I think all Swedes know. And that's Trigara Kaning and Vara. And so I'm going to ask you to sing all four verses as we first listen to it, to the melody. I'm going to play it through one time, and then the next time it starts is when you're supposed to sing. Professional taping, you know. Trigara kaning en vara en guds lila barna skara kärna ne på himla festet fågen ej kända nästet Herren sina trogna vårdar ut i seans helga gårdar Över dem han sig förbarmar Bär dem upp på farers armar Ingen nöd och ingen lycka 
skar du hans hand dem rika han var vän för andra vänner sina barns bekymmer känner vad han tar och vad han giver samma fader han dock bliver och hans mål är blått den ena barnet sanna väl alena Låt oss nu alla bedja så som vår Herre Jesus Kristus själv har lärt oss Fader vår som är i himmelen helgat var i ditt namn Tillkomma dit rika, ske din vilja, så som i himlen, så och på jorden. Och vårt dagliga bröd giv oss idag, och förlåt oss våra skulder, så som och vi förlåter dem och skyldiga är och. Och inleder oss icke i frälstelse, utan fräls oss ifrån ondo. Till riket är dit och makten och härligheten i evighet. Amen. We want to thank Arthur for that beautiful solo. I thought it was a duet. I think I saw one other soul thing. Wasn't that good? I'm supposed now to share with you the fact that there is a reception to be held plan for each one present down at the Presbyterian Church. Is that correct? Down at Ms. Smith? Down at the It's interesting to note that Baptists are not the only ones that multiply by dividing. I noticed the Swedes did that. But uh, we hope this has been informative. Uh, you appreciate, I'm sure, along with me, the history and all the work that went in composing the history of this Uppsala area. And I think we should say to Mrs. Smith, we appreciate all of her great effort. She majored in history in college and deserves a hand from us for doing what she did. I suppose now that we'll retire to the air-conditioned facilities down at uh, the Presbyterian Church.